Good afternoon, everybody. This is The Take Up. Today we have episode 44, Office Hours with Eric, how I got started in embroidery, plus Q&A. Good afternoon, everybody. It is 2.30 Mountain Time, and you welcome to The Take Up. Today is a little different. It's a little laid back. It's a little bit uh, off kilter from what I usually do, and you'll have to forgive me for any sort of uh, strangeness in the audio, strangeness in the controls, and uh, strangeness in general, because this is kind of a post-holiday kind of chill day in most of the U.S., and uh, under some advisement from my wife who says I don't ever stop <laughs> working for any good period of time, I am in my home office, uh, not running out to the beautiful and brilliant studios. Today I am actually in my own home office, which is currently partially unfurnished. We bought a house not too long ago. Uh, and uh, here to do the take up with you guys to talk a little bit personally about what we're doing. So we can consider this the fireside chat, though, from how cold it is in here today. I'll tell you there's no fire going on in my office. However, it should be sort of a chat talking about uh, not only personally how I came into the industry, a little bit about my history, but hopefully a little bit about how I think people can become great embroiders and digitizers, and not that I necessarily would count myself among those those ranks, uh, but how people can get better in the skill, um, how people come to the come to the conclusion that they want to be in apparel decoration and what it means to them. And we're going to go through a couple different things as we go through that. And like I said, q and I'm hoping that people bring some questions, some comments, some things that they want to discuss. Uh, I have been very busy lately, but I have had some interesting questions people brought up, and that this is part of it. There are tons of people who said to me, you know, we would like to hear more about uh, how you got into this industry, how you got to be where you are. And frankly, I, that's something I've shared before. And I think that some of you people who've known me for a while will be getting a recap of uh, my history with embroidery again. But hopefully it's something that's interesting. And I'll, like I always tell everybody else, I say share where you are, no matter where you are in your journey with your work, because there is someone who is uh, just before where you are, who'd like to know where you, how you got to where you were. They'd like to know the steps to get where you are. And there is somebody who is later on in their stages than you who would like to recapture some bit of that perspective that you had. Uh, before we get started, though, let's go ahead and say hi to some folks. Uh, first, I don't have a personal name for you, but does his name Ruha Stitches, I'm going to guess. Uh, hello, Eric. Very much excited to know how you get into the industry. Uh, yeah, well, it should be, I don't know if it's a very interesting story, but I'll say this, like many people in apparel decoration, I kind of slid into it sideways. I did not intend to become an embroiderer, uh, but that's not very surprising. What I will say is uh, very much like Terry Combs for Two Regular Guys always says, it's a bit like Hotel California. Once you come in, you can never leave. And I'll say that in the nicest way possible. It's the thing you don't want to leave once you start. Let's go ahead and say hi to some folks who have commented as we get going here. Uh, Jeff Fuller of M Nerd and uh, himself an embroiderer of skill. Uh, hello, Jeff. Good to see you here. Richard, hello. Happy Friday to you. Jeff says you're interested in this story. I'm surprised. I thought for sure you'd heard me talk too much about it already, but hopefully the audio is not too bad and everybody gets something out of it today. Uh, Tom Farr of Buzzards Bay Embroidery, awesome embroiderer himself. Tom, ha hello. Happy to see you here. Frank Dunn from Across the Pond. Good evening also. Everybody who is Across the Pond today, good evening. I know you guys are dealing with all of the Americans. All the Yanks over here are uh, having a bit of an off day, a slow day today because we've been uh, piling in the turkey and or other Thanksgiving meals, but hopefully you've also seen the outpourings of Thanksgiving because we do have a bit of a thoughtful day this, this time of the year. Uh, Sean, hi, happy to see you here, Sean. Christine, happy Black Friday, Eric. Have you been bombed by Black Friday emails? I have. Yes, I have. And also, uh, as I'm going to talk about a little bit, guys, I am an e-commerce person too. And I almost concurrently with the work I did in embroidery, I, I was an e-commerce person back from the days where you had to build carts onto your sites that you were building in tables. And um, I actually don't love Black Friday, Cyber Monday. I am someone who, if I can do something else, I mean, do you have to show up for Black Friday, Cyber Monday? Absolutely, you do. I don't love the hard push. I don't love the incredibly, incredibly deep discounts that uh, eat, eat up profit. And so I often don't do them. I Will there be discounts on these days? Absolutely. I don't do the kind of predatory emails thing. And I generally tend not to do the rush, rush, rush kind of selling. I tend to do a, an email that has some other value in it or a, a an ad that has some other value in it, something interesting, something entertaining, something thoughtful, and then add some you know discounts to it. So you know, it depends on how you want to take it. There's different brands out there. There are brands that do better with it, brands that don't. But I'm, I'll say this. Uh, I'm glad that we're not doing the trampling each other Black Friday. I wish it wasn't because of why it was. Uh, Ron, Great force of positivity of good graphics. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving, Ron. Happy to have you in here. 
Uh, and <laughs> Christine's saying, good for you. Glad you're listening to your wife and relaxing a bit. I'll say this. I didn't rush myself off to the office. She has been kind of telling me, hey, quit checking your phone and work, working on your e-commerce stuff. You guys don't know I'm managing an e-commerce channel now. So I've actually been uh, pasted to Amazon and on call, but nobody needs to know that stuff. Matt coming in. Hello, Eric. Hi, Matt. How you doing, sir? Of MNERD as well, and also Embroider and Digitizer. Uh, Jeff, what's the instrument over my left shoulder? We can get to that. That is a mountain dulcimer, one of several. And I actually have one off camera. I'll pick it up now and show you guys. Uh, this is something that I have uh, not been playing very much, but I used to play a great deal and uh, to the point of kind of playing in folk festivals and stuff like that. So um, I am incredibly rusty. I almost can't play from tablature right now. I'm so rusty. I can noodle around and still finger pick, but I'm not all that great. So we will talk about dulcimer maybe a little bit as we go through the day here. But yeah, so that's, yeah. So to answer all the questions, what's the instrument? Yeah, it's a mountain dulcimer, Appalachian dulcimer. Very interesting is instrument. If you hadn't heard it, I might uh, pick that thing up and make it make some sounds later. We'll see if I get enough courage to do that. Uh, like I told you guys, just because I'm here and do this all the time doesn't mean I don't get nervous. And picking up a dulcimer after having not played one for some time and playing it on camera is something I'm not sure I'm going to do today. <laughs> we'll find out. And Christine, like you said, mandolins, mountain dulcimer. And these are hourglass mountain dulcimers specifically. They come in different shapes and sizes, and we can talk about that. So we'll talk about that for sure. Uh, uh, Justin, Justin, also, as I meant, a digitizer and M nerd himself. Ha Hello, E Rich at home. Yes, I am at home for sure. Frank is right. Dulcimer, good, good get for an American instrument, my friend. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Frank never sleeps. Yeah, he's up with us all the time, guys. Uh, everybody's saying hi to uh, Candy Kramer saying, I too am interested in New Jersey. I too want to get into the embellishing business. I love my passion of embroidery as well as sewing. It's a great place to start from. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't start from there. Um, we can, we'll talk a little bit about my early history, my early life, and uh, how I might have had a little bit of a head, uh, heads up because uh, uh, of my background. But honestly, I didn't start for, with a love for embroidery. I started with a love of uh, computers and a love of digital graphics. And that was a different thing entirely, but it got me there. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, and Christine, uh, talking about the Black Friday stuff that I don't always love the predatory Black Friday email stuff. Uh, I'm with you on that. I always try to avoid Black Friday, Cyber Monday, as an end mart. I'd rather do a good sale at a different time when everyone else isn't doing a sale. Uh, for us, we do a longer sale. <laughs> we do a longer sale that spans more than this. This is a good question, honestly, guys. How do you handle Black Friday, Cyber Monday? What I would say is you do content um, before it in advance. And what we did and what I often do is say, hey, let's take the pressure off. I'm going to have a sale that lasts beyond it. If you're shopping that day and you want to know, yes, here's a sale. Here's what the sale is. But our coupons aren't going to run out quite that quickly. We're into the next week past it if you want to. Now, certainly when you're talking about custom decorating, this has to come with cutoff dates and explicit instructions when it comes to what you can produce by the holidays because that's a big deal. However, yeah, always I would I prefer doing a good sale that's solid, not an incredibly cutthroat, uh, too deep for a profit sale. I don't like to do anything that's going to cut profits too much. Um, but something that lasts a little longer and takes the pressure off. You can do this two ways. One of the great ways to handle sales and people will create urgency by making something end at a certain time. You can still have the end there with there and visible to them say, we are definitely ending it at the end of next week. However, our coupon code lasts a little bit beyond the other Black Friday sales, so you don't have to freak out and get it purchased by midnight. Um, there is a way to answer a question where the customer's problem is, I'm in a rush doing all these sales and I'm scared of, of missing out. And you tell them, with us, you won't have to miss out. And now I've solved a problem for the customer. So there's one way you can handle that. And there's free Q&A tip number one outside of stories. <laughs> and Frank says to Jeff, uh, you're always here too. Yeah, you guys are all there. Uh, I sleep in the morning. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I slept in too. I didn't get up immediately and start working on stuff. <laughs> Mike Muldowney, by the way, who is helping us out with some memes. We're going to hit some memes right after this. Uh, Aloha. Happy to see you here. <laughs> Sean says, please play your instruments. I, I will think about it. I will definitely think about it. Frank says, you used to play banjo. Then you understand, my friend. Uh, and <laughs> Matt says, encore. We will see. Bonus time, maybe time for some dulcimer. The thing that's going to look weird is you play it in your lab, and my camera is not set up to show me playing. So what you'll have is my face looking intently down while music appears from nowhere. I already found this out last time I played one when someone asked me and I was on camera. But we will certainly do it. But before we do any of that, we're going to get to my story. We're going to get to all that. We're going to get to Q&A. We're going to do some memes because everybody said last week when I put up some embroidery memes that they loved it. Well, we're going to do some memes. And because Mike was so awesome and showed us some memes, 
Uh, and also we had some other memes here from like Vitor. I'm only gonna do a few of them because if I do 10, 20 memes every time, we're gonna have no time left for anything else. But we're gonna do a few embroidery memes today and I will uh, of course give my own dramatic interpretation. So let's go ahead and add this to the stream. So this one's from Mike Muldani, as you see in the comments today, reciprocator number one. This cap design won't sew. You have to digitize for caps. It's fine on screen. You have to run a test. It looks great on Twill. Yeah, everybody always says it looks great on Twill. <laughs> So here's the thing. It also looks great on five stacks of uh, cutaway backing, but it's not what you're actually going to run, and it's not what's going to be in a garment. So, yeah, I love this one, guys. All right, here's the next one. Stop calling me. Any left chest, five bucks. Hey, I'm a digitizer, and I understand this. I hate to say it. I was an in-house digitizer. I didn't do this. I did some outside uh, work, but by that point, I was established enough. People came to me for it. Um, I still, to this day, with great regularity, have to tell digitizers that I don't need their work. But... <laughs> You know, it's not that I wouldn't use a contractor. It's just that uh, I almost can't make myself, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know you all do great work. And some of you I taught myself. And even then, I can't help but get in the middle of it myself. It's hard when you're a digitizer to want to do that. And uh, we have all had the, hey, guys, what do you think about this design? PM me, PM me, PM me. <laughs> Everybody knows. Uh, and here's one from Vitor, actually. Uh, can you do a hat with metallic thread for me? Oh. A little dark humor, I'm sorry, especially these days, but um, not everybody loves doing hats with metallic thread, going over that seam full of multiple folded in layers of buckerman or crinoline and material can be less than fun with the extra abrasion. And this one from, I believe from Jeff, yes it is, uh, Weblon is part of my religion. Uh, this is the way. <laughs> All right, folks. So that's probably enough memes for today. <laughs> Let's back out of the memes for a minute and see if we can talk about something else. Uh, however, I do sincerely appreciate the embroidery memes. If you want to send memes in, comment them here. Catch me on social media, Eric Campbell. You get me from here. Or if you're on YouTube, or you can go to uh, ericcampbell.com and you can go to my contact us page. If you want to submit memes, submit memes. You want to submit questions, submit questions, and we may be able to do this. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, guys. Anyway, it's something that I like to show on. So I like to have some fun and especially on a day like today where we're going to be really just talking some personal stuff and some fun stuff. Uh, love to get a laugh in and we could all use a laugh these days. So yeah, send me embroidery memes. I, I like to do them and, uh, us elder millennials, uh, very elder millennials or exennials. If you're, if you're closer to it, uh, we, we like the memes. Yeah, Matthew, we, we love the memes. Yes, we do. We do fresh memes all day, folks, fresh memes. All right, so let's get on to the actual matter of the show. And like I said, super conversational today. If you have questions, you want to talk about something else, you have a question about embroidery in general, go ahead and throw it in the comments. I might wait till the end to answer some of them, but we'll try and catch them. Hopefully they don't run by before I see them. But we're going to make this a very easy, laid back kind of day since uh, as the two guys did this morning, most people are off for today. And <laughs> I was told once again, you sure you're going to do an episode today? And I'm like, man, I just can't help to keep my streak alive. Plus I have a lot of you lovely people who are not in the US recovering from turkey comas today. So <laughs> it's it's a good idea. Oh, and by the way, I love this one here. Mike says, maybe every takeo can end with a moment of meme rather than a moment of zen. Uh, thanks, John Stewart Law. Absolutely, that may be the thing is to, the last frame I put up might be the meme once we get this done. That might be the way to handle it. Uh, maybe one in the beginning, one at the end, we'll bookmark our whole, uh, whole end. we'll bookend this whole fun part of the education with uh, some some laughs. Some some fresh memes for the people. All right, but let's go ahead and start this out, guys. Uh, the big question I actually received just was flat out, hey, Eric, how did you get into embroidery? How did you start doing this stuff? Uh, and what's your education? That's the other thing. Um, the first thing I'm going to tell you is, despite the fact that I would love to claim that I have a particular fancy education that leads me to embroidery and design and all the great things that I do, I absolutely do not. Uh, my education is not in digitizing or embroidery, textiles, or design. Uh, I have taken approximately one drawing class. Actually, you can see, um, sadly, over my shoulder here, and I always mess up which side. There we are. <laughs> the camera reverses everything. Uh, over here, my shoulder here is a self-portrait from the one and only uh, class that I ever did for uh, drawing. I did drawing one in college because I needed some uh, studio time. Uh, so th there's the, the one drawing course that I did. Other than that, everything else I've done in design and uh, embroidery is self-taught. And so none of this is my education. And in fact, the first thing I did coming uh, in high school, I was a baker. 
Uh, the very first job I had was to bake and not a real baker. I didn't do anything that I would consider real baking. I didn't mix or make things or really work under someone. I was a baker at a bagel shop. So I, I took bagels that were pre-made and made them for everyone and handled big giant ovens and all that stuff. So my first real job was as a baker in an Einstein's bagels. Not that you need to necessarily know that. If you're in the States, that might mean something to you. If not, it won't. But that was my first job. And during that time, however, I was going to school. I actually started doing college courses early and uh, these were all focused on medievalism. So what this means is the, the study of the medieval period. Generally for me, it was pre-Christian Scandinavia and also uh, the period including Old English. So England, but Old English. And so the language and literature, Old English and a bit of Old Norse. And like I said, uh, medieval Scandinavia, early medieval Scandinavia and uh, early medieval England. So that's really what I studied and I did literature. Of course, literature, creative writing, things like that, of course, as well, because I was an English major, but the focus was also uh, in my school, that was the way you did medievalism was through the humanities and the English major program. And then uh, my specialism was in uh, actually medieval studies. I, I have a minor in German and I am so rusty after not speaking for 10 years that I can understand and speak very little. Unfortunately, I understand people fine. I can listen to German news, but uh, my ability to speak partially because I'm so nervous about doing it incorrectly is poor now. So uh, going from doing 500 level courses where I was writing essays in German to being uh, very poor at it. So what I would say folks is uh, practice things that you want to keep up because they will run away from you if you do not. Uh, but my original education is there. It is in medievalism. So what I'll actually put up on screen here, people always say, oh, old English. And most people will say, oh yeah, Shakespeare. And I go, no, far, far older than Shakespeare. By the time we're talking about this stuff, old English was more uh, like German. It's a Germanic language of English. So I'm going to go ahead and actually do my party trick. I usually do this from memory, uh, which I can do the first few lines from memory, but I wanted to show this on screen so you can see what it looks like. This is Beowulf. If you've heard of Beowulf, this is the poem Beowulf in Old English. I'm actually going to read you a couple lines out of it in close to how it sounded in, in the you know estimation of what we have. And I'm rusty as heck with this too. But this is what Beowulf sounded like. And this is what I did for semesters. Uh, what? We gardena in yerdagum theod kuninga thrymjufrunum. Huda atheling us Ellen Fremelon, oft shield shaping sheatena threatum, moneum maidum, meodo settler of teach, edge so the airless. So there's the first few lines of Beowulf, and I spent a couple of semesters translating Beowulf and working in Old English and doing stuff like that. So, yes, this is not related to embroidery at all. So, when people ask me, What's your education? How'd you get to embroidery from that? Um, I will say uh, sideways through family connections, through accidents of side jobs and working in other ways, not actually working <laughs> at all in the embroidery field. So how did I get there? Like I said, almost by accident. So that's what I started out doing. And I actually did go back and get my degree. So I worked through, through as I was becoming an embroiderer, I actually worked through and got my degree and I do have a bachelor's. That's all I have. I didn't go on to do more graduate work. I've done graduate coursework, but didn't go on to do anything more than that. Uh, I had to make a choice. And what actually happened at that point, um, <laughs> by the way, I love this, sorry. I, when somebody stops and says this stuff, this kills me. Uh, Matt got me with something funny. Uh, this is exactly how an embroidery machine reads a DST in that voice. Uh, yes, I am the voice of the embroidery machine. <laughs> That's why I call myself the ghost in the embroidery machine, guys. Now we'll, we'll talk about that later when I talk about all the history of how I got to where I am. But yes, I. It, I, the, the language is awesome. I do like doing it. And like I said, that's my party trick. If you if you catch me at these shows and somebody asks me for what's the, the uh, kind of cocktail party trick, it's to repeat that chunk of Beowulf from memory. I used to be able to do quite a few more lines than that. Uh, but yes, Old English, very interesting stuff. And like I said, I did that stuff during the time I was first working. I was actually going to school for that uh, while I was working in the shops. But here's, here's how things went. Originally, what did I do? How did I first start this stuff? Uh, well, the truth of the matter was, I like to call myself a box hauler. Uh, I actually had a family connection. My, uh, my mom, <laughs> my mom, Kay Campbell, if you've ever seen her comment, my mom uh, was working at a place that did artistic t-shirt printing, screen printing, and embroidery. And that was the original place where she was working. And she, I'd actually, many times I'd gone to help her at other places she had worked. She uh, And also she at one time was a seamstress for Pioneer Wear, a place that made Levi's out here. So yeah, um, my mom's a seamstress and can sew incredible things that I can't imagine because I do not do construction sewing really. Um, it's something that people ask, they go, oh, well then you, your mom must have taught you everything about embroidery. And I'd say, no, actually not. Not in any slight to my mom. She can make incredible work. And uh, honestly, 
I will say that maybe my familiarity or my feeling of what thread and fabric are come from my, some part of that might be infused. It was osmotically absorbed into me when I was a kid going to fabric shops with my mom. But I will say that, no, we didn't really have embroidery as a thing we did in my house. What I will say is, um, my mother is very artistically inclined and had some art school background herself. Uh, so she's very artistically inclined, very creative and a seamstress. My father is a mechanic and very mechanically inclined, very smart about that and very technical in that way. He knows how to diagnose and deal with things. And I would say uh, maybe I am lucky and genetically gifted. I don't know. But what I will say is that it, it mostly the process into becoming more than just what I'm saying here, a box hauler, uh, is something I undertook later on out of my own curiosity. So curiosity above everything, I think, drives you to do what you do. But I started out as what I would call a box hauler. My mom was working in the uh, warehousing and the kind of uh, fulfillment and I would say management logistics part of a, of a shirt company and also uh, helping out with all sorts of things, production and everything else. As you know, with a small business, there's no one thing that you do. And I came on to help out, to help out at the shop. And originally I was, I was hauling boxes. So I spent some time uh, over the summer uh, rolling around in a box truck delivering to different shops, delivering shirts to shops uh, and doing that kind of stuff. And that's really where, where this all started out. I was hauling boxes around in the back of a box truck, a delivery truck, and hauling big boxes, 80 pound boxes of shirts and dropping them off places. That's my initial reaction. That's how it started out. Thing is, uh, as I tend to be, I was always a computer kid. In fact, I, in, I wasn't a kid who was into thread and needles and uh, wasn't into sewing machines, I was into computers. So what usually happened with me, literally from the time I was 13 on, when my mom would bring me to work, somebody would have a problem with their computer. And despite the fact that I was a tiny tot, <laughs> I was still playing with toys. Uh, you know, Actually, before I was 13, I think 13 is the first time I did something where I got compensated for working on computers. Uh, they would bring me up to the front and say, my internet's not working. Can you fix my modem? And yes, we are talking about dial-up modems. Yeah, I, I worked on people's computers for them. So it got to be understood that I could work on the computers. That's part of that, how that started. But it's like, okay, so I was a technical person, had a, an aptitude for learning things on my own. And that's how I ended up starting to help with operating machines. And that's the next part. I was a machine operator for a little while. And that's, honestly, it didn't take long. The phase where I was just an operator was not very long, I will say but this is where I started into it. I was hauling boxes around and it came up to the point where we needed another operator. We needed somebody to help out with machines. And if you've ever seen pictures of me with these really, really old Tajima machines, honestly, the pictures of me are almost from almost always from my later shop, um, from later shops I worked at. But these earliest times I was working on these old, old Tajima machines, not like the beautiful ZSK machine that I'm usually have behind me in my backdrop. Uh, these machines were fairly beat up, six needle machines, nine needle machines, not a lot of, uh, conveniences on these things. The panels not only did not have uh, you know, displays of any kind, they didn't even have character displays. They had individual LED bulbs and switches next to them for turning things on and off. So this is the age of the machine we're talking about. Uh, I worked on these incredibly old machines, didn't have thread brake sensors, any of that. Now part of it's also because the machines themselves were in poor repair. But um, these were the first machines I operated and I ran 12 head machines. And uh, this is back in the time where and people called, it, called people like me a watcher because you had to really watch the machine run like a hawk because if something broke, you had to stop it yourself. You were hitting the emergency stop and you were running, backing up the machine and fixing whatever problems yourself. And it wasn't stopping when things were running out of bobbin or when it was the threads were breaking, at least uh, not in, the, in my shop, at least. Uh, and the machines that I had had no capacity for this. So I was a, an operator and a watcher. So that's uh, and so he says, um, do you recall the model number of those first machines? I do not. I'd have to look it up. But these were definitely, these were six needle Tajima machines were the first ones I was on. So we're talking about flat machines, not tubular. They had a big table up. Uh, we had spectacle frames, which is where you have this big plastic thing. It looks like little glasses, why they call them spectacle frames, or they call them the spider, or some people call them, where essentially there is a, a plastic support that you popped a frame in, and the frame did not have arms. It didn't connect to arms on the thing. It was inside of a big sash, almost like a sash frame, and that spectacle frame would take a, a, a hoop that looked very much like an old school hand embroidery hoop and you aligned it with the lugs where the screws were. So that's the kind of stuff I started out with. These spectacle frames, flat machines, still great for a lot of things. You can get a lot of productivity out of them. They're harder to align with the shirt themselves. You have to be very careful in your hooping. So we had a lot of uh, self-made hoop jigs, stuff like that. But in that case, uh, yeah. And by the way, Jeff, I love this answer. Do I recall the model number of machines? One, LOL. Yeah, I'm not quite old enough. I wasn't on a worker machine. I wasn't on a, like, Isaac Singer's first sample machine in the 1800s. But hey, you know, 
old enough, or at least let's say this, I worked on older technology quite frequently. I, I was in shops that were not exactly um, full of the most newfangled technology in all this time. So I did a lot of working with older technology and I've done digitizing on machines and software that really should be people a little older than me. When I start to vibe with people in the embroidery industry, a lot of times they're older than I am because they I've worked on the same equipment they did because I worked in shops that were perhaps not the most uh, well-funded when it first started out. And uh, to that point, to some degree, I'll let you know, I've, I've actually ridden out shops family. Uh, shops going out of business during hard times. And so when I talk about things about like, um, what I say about your workflow or what kind of jobs you should do or marketing and why I kind of stress things about diversifying. The reason I talk about that so much is because I've seen shops fail and I've had to be present during those last months of shops failing um, or at least getting so old about those things. And, and yes, my the spider frames, I still can't wrap my hand around how those work. Yeah, it's very much like a home machine. Funny enough, home embroiderers, spider frames, those kind of frames we're talking about, very much like a home machine has a flat bed. You have to roll the garment out from underneath it and to get things straight, you just have to know that the uh, lugs, I believe on those all went down or up. Now I can't remember off the top of my head, um, but the two lugs where the screws were had to go uh, either vertically, vertically or top or bottom. You just had to kind of know how things were straight and had to be very careful with your jigs and your alignment. That and also did a lot of hooping on a flat table. Um, I, will, I don't recommend it because the jig is better and makes things easier, but a lot of hooping on a flat table, and a lot of being very careful, uh, just how it is. But yeah, I was a machine operator. And what I'm gonna say about that is this, I think that it's incredibly useful to be a machine operator. And I'm actually gonna go ahead and post something for you guys. I've got a link that I think is useful for you. And, and this essentially talks about um, my process for becoming a proficient digitizer. And I think being a machine operator is a big part of that, guys. So first thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and I'll, if I can get you this stuff real quick, this is the link for it, bit.ly slash three step digi. I will go ahead and post the actual link into the comments for you so you can catch it. But this is something I did for Mr. X Stitch. So I did it less in a commercial vein, more in a craft and art vein for those folks. But um, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about, the steps that I went through to get things done. And what I'm gonna say is I think that machine operation is really important to the process of becoming a great digitizer. Um, no matter what you do, I think you should operate machines that at least run good designs, run designs that are known good and run designs that run bad and watch the fabric react. Watching the fabric react makes a big difference. So how I got into this though, they needed a machine operator and I decided, I, or I, I volunteered, I volunteered to do that. And what I'm gonna say about everything that I talked to you about, about how I got where I got, a lot of it was saying yes to things I wasn't sure about, spending a lot of long hours learning things on my own and uh, taking a lot of risks with that. Now, is it always the best idea to say yes? Do you always have the ability to say yes? Maybe you don't. What I'm going to say is it takes a lot of yes and a lot of uh, knowing that you don't know enough and trying to get where you want to go. Uh, the first thing I did was say yes to that, being a machine operator. And as I became a machine operator, like I said, I ran machines. We had these great uh, we had designs. We had a library of designs, a lot of them done by people who had, uh, were punchers. They were not digitizing the way we know it now where you draw a shape and then it fills with stitches according to parameters. They were literally dropping every single stitch on a big digitizing board at a six to one ratio with a big drawn cartoon. These are people who are literally dropping every single stitch. And we had a, a large library of those as well as a library of more modern designs. And a lot of these designs were done by people who were considered masters of their time. And I got to watch these designs run. Uh, so what I'll say about that is that I eventually got this chance where they had taken all these paper tape stocks and had them converted to DST files. And I was allowed to peruse those DST files. And actually I had to manage those DST files because it was part of my job to, of course, operate and run these things, right? So part of what I did, of course, was to load those up and be able to handle that. The thing was, uh, we eventually, it was all done on disks. Originally, I just had disks. I had disks. I had no chance to really look at these things. And so I asked if there was some other method, like how do we copy these disks? Because all I had were big giant file cabinets full of disks and envelopes. That was the system at the time. Floppy disks, three, you know, three and a half floppy disks. And these were what we, what we had. That's what we did for transfer. We loaded up floppy disks. And at this time, of course, we also had essentially transfer units, which were boxes that spooled up the data. You threw a disk in the front and you logged it in. It was a separate box from the machine itself because the machines could be hooked up to a tape reader. They could be hooked up to any source. And those, those boxes emulated a tape reader and sent that stuff up. So essentially, I, I asked what we were doing about that. And they said, oh, yeah, a machine makes this stuff. And then they, I asked, hey, what's that over in the corner under that big dust cover? I see a computer over there. What is that? Can I get on the internet with that? Can I look stuff up? Hey, no, what is that? That is a digitizing system. 
that's the thing that makes the designs, but nobody really knows how to use it. And so, of course, knowing me, I had been making my own uh, digital art. My parents were very wonderful, despite the fact that, uh, you know, money wasn't always good for this kind of thing. They had bought me computers to run on. And I, I had been making, you know, pixel art, as you might say today, drawing individual art in 256 colors, pixel by pixel. And I had had all kinds of hand-me-down computers from relatives back to like the Sears VIC-20, the Commodore 64. I had played with computers and I suddenly had this realization that I could make a thing on a computer that I could then create physically and that I had access to that right here in front of me. So I had art in front of me. I had the ability to take something digital and make it real. And that was exciting. So I volunteered. I said, I would love to learn that. I would love to learn that stuff. And uh, my boss at the time, this is a place called uh, SGI, not no longer in business, Silk Screen Graphics Incorporated. They later became Matrix or were bought by Matrix, depending on how, uh, how that all of us shook out. And we can talk about that some other time. Um, but that company, essentially, the boss there said, oh, yeah, you can totally do that on your own time. If you want to, on your own time, work on this machine, you can absolutely learn how to use it. And you'll, here's the manual. And here's the machine and don't break anything. And you can't take anything home, but we will give you a key. And as long, are, you, are you willing to be here early in the morning and unlock and be here at last, last of the day and lock up? Well, yeah, well, then you can do it. So I spent a lot of late nights by myself learning that software um, entirely on my own. There was no other resources. What eventually came to be is that I got to see some industry magazines. So there are some times that did get different after that, right? I became, what I'm going to say, I was a digitizing newbie. And what I did first, and this is without people telling me, I just thought, you know, I see these designs that look good. I know that I have to get better. I need to figure out how they run. I need to analyze these designs. And so when I teach you guys design analysis, this is directly out of my experience. I took the designs into the software and I realized that if I looked at them in the software and also the physical embroidery, I could take it with a ruler and a magnifying glass and go, how long is that stitch? How close together are these lines of stitching? What's the stitch angle? How far is the fill overlapped under this border of satin stitches that are supposed to go on it? Why does it work the way it works? And what can I learn by tearing this design apart piece by piece? And so I watched a lot of designs run and unfortunately, at the time, I really didn't have a digital preview that worked very well. What I did have is I could advance through them stitch by stitch. So I can remember um, hours upon hours of watching these masterful designs being done, um, holding down the arrow key or popping the arrow key over and over. This is a DOS-based system. I believe it displayed, it might have displayed 256 colors. I think it was 16 colors, the first one we worked on. Um, and it just really, it didn't have anything to it. It's not realistic colors. It's not smoothed out. It, it was vector lines. It, you know, it looked like... a an old game of Missile Command. Like imagine that, if you can imagine like Missile Command on an arcade machine, and believe me, I know a lot of you may be too young to know that, this is what we're talking about. This is the kind of level of graphics we're talking about. And it was often on a black screen and it was like I said, DOS based, no other graphical stuff. I couldn't really do much else but advance through the designs, but I could look at things, I could measure things, and I could, um, as I was paging through things, I could look at the coordinates and do things like figure out how long a stitch was, and by the time, I mean, we're talking about looking at stitch angles with protractors. <laughs> there were times where I did some pretty crazy stuff to try and figure out how designs worked. And I watched these designs run and I did these analyses and I did, I literally wrote them down in a notebook where I had this, I would show, have a picture of the design. I, get, I even got to the point where I was putting this all in um, desktop publishing software because I, I had also uh, been working at school when I was in high school. I did like the literary magazine and I had been someone who did graphics and layout and stuff like that. So I would put together a little published piece. And I mean, it's cringy now because I, I, am, I am schooly. I am a try hard schooly kid. Uh, I would put together a piece where it was like, here's the picture of the finished design. Here's a picture of the preview of the design. Here are the, here's the number of stitches. Here, here are the fill number one in this area. Here's the stitch count. Here's the angles. Here's the density. And I would write up a dossier on a design I was trying to figure out. So I would absolutely analyze a design to the nth degree. And then from that, I would learn what kind of fills do I want to make? What are the, where are the penetration points line up? Where are the, you know, where, where is the stitch length lining up? What is the density of this piece? As we know, density, if you take a fill, you measure from one line across a second to the third line, perpendicular to the stitch angle, you're going to get the density. Why do I teach that stuff, guys? Because that's how I learned how to get my densities right. When I first tried, my densities were way too dense. My stitches were way too short. I had immense problems on the machine when I first tried. And my first trials were not on a single head machine. They were on that 12 head machine. 
So you can imagine it was scary to fire up that big iron with uh, the first designs I ever did and they weren't particularly good. Now, I will say this, this method of work sped me up. The pain of doing that work myself and running it myself, especially by the time I, I was allowed to run, we had a, we got a single head in. We had a Brother BAS 415, which I loved. I still love that little machine. Commercial Brother machine. So we're not talking about a home machine. Commercial Brother machine uh, that had nine needles and it was just my baby. And most of my best work, have you ever seen some of my older work that I really love? A lot of it was done on that BAS 415. Um, and when I did that work, that was a lot easier. It was great. And I eventually was allowed to pull that digitizing system out of the mothballs. I stuck it right next to the embroidery machine. And I, as I was working, I would go to break and work on my own stuff and I'd make my own designs and I would work on, uh, learning and testing and swatch tests and testing fills and densities and stuff like that. And that's how I would handle my initial tests. I would sit there on that machine, make these tests, do some analysis, go back make a patch of fill, sew it out on my single head. And then I had some analysis. I could put the numbers to an actual piece that I could look at. So the stuff I'm teaching now is the stuff I taught myself then. And that's how I started. That's how I started becoming a digitizer, not just an operator. So I got into this absolutely sideways, holler on boxes, raised my hand when it came time that they needed somebody to do this work. The only thing that was scary about this is I went from being a newbie to a full-time in-house digitizer for a major, fairly major company at the time. We had a huge warehouse, multiple automatic screen print presses, big oval presses, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, and we were running for big stores. We were running for, um, actually, we were doing stuff for, I don't know how much I want to talk about everything, but we were doing stuff for big mall stores and department stores, which at the time were gigantic and doing fulfillment stuff like that. So we were doing major brands. Not, okay, Hot Topic, stuff like that. We did uh, Nautica, Chaps, Ralph Lauren, bunch of brands like that. And I actually got to do some of the embroidery work for those folks at, at a time. At least some of the, we did some of the sampling in-house for them and some development stuff. But we're doing all that kind of work. And I went from starting on my own and digitizing to my boss going, well, I can save money on all this digitizing. This is at an era where we were still hiring out to people who were charging, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars per tape. And when I say tapes, remember that this is coming from a place where people were starting out. Um, paper tapes were still within memory for the people who we were contracting with because this company had some history. So they called them tapes. And I actually still to some days will forget and call designs tapes because of this. And why is that? Paper tape and punching and calling designs tapes was the way we used to do it back in the day, even when we were far past that point and everything was digital. Um, but this is, at a, this is at a time where when I first started, we were still receiving discs in the mail. The first shop that I was at before I did all this, when I was just a kid, they were still receiving discs at the in the mail. By the time I got there, it was email discs, stuff like that. It was tapes. It was, you know, designs that weren't tapes, DST files, in, you know, in email. But the within memory inside of that file cabinet that was there that I had gone, had gone to, we had mailed in what we called job jackets. We had uh, mailed in discs that were inside of these big manila envelopes with job information in them and on them. And that's how it was when I first started out. And like I said, I operated machines and I learned firsthand how that holistic interaction happened. And then within three months of my first time digitizing, I was digitizing everything for the company. Now, we had some stuff where I had to have things added. We brought stuff in from people, but I was doing the primary bulk. I mean, really the primary bulk of the work within about three months of when I first started, I was doing all that work and definitely all the local work was all coming through me. And honestly, I did okay. I won't say those were the best designs of my life, but I look back and some of the designs that I still show today are from that era. The Dion's apron that I show you guys is the pizza man that is all one color. and Everybody loves all the individual details where I did all of it manually, one stitch at a time. That was done in my first software and it was done in that period of time. It was done before I got my first uh, modern Windows-based software. So I will say that very early in my career, I think I did well, but I did well because I really did live and breathe, breathe this stuff. And it's something that not everybody's going to be able to do. Uh, I was a young man with no other opportunity or no other opportunities around me aside from doing my schoolwork. So I would go from intensely working on my education to intensely working on my embroidery and didn't have anything else that I was doing. So I'm going to say that it is not for everybody. It's not what everybody does, but it is definitely what we were doing at the time. It was what I did at the time because I'm, I'm an obsessive person and very curious. So yeah, three month ramp. Do I think that's going to happen for everybody? Absolutely not. And what I'm going to tell you is this was me staying up till two, three, four in the morning, sometimes doing overnight, sometimes 
uh, being on the machine and people saying, boy, you sure got here early and I wasn't here early. I was there overnight um, because I was consistently working on that that stuff. And I'm also going to say, uh, now that we are past the statute of limitations, I would take my dongle home and I had DOS emulators and making that stuff work. And there were times where I would take the dongle home and work on my own machine. Um, and I also eventually, I'm going to tell you this, learned how to dial into my computer at work. Once we had the ability to do that, and I would go home or be at the university and dialed into my design computer that where the monitor was off, but the computer was on, and I would be digitizing remotely over really old broadband internet, um, very early internet that was not great for doing remote work. And let me tell you how slow it is to digitize over the internet at that point. Super rough. So yeah, uh, Mike says, that is a steep curve from zero to in-house guy. Yeah, yeah, it really was. Um, but what I'm going to say is that's that's that trial by fire. I don't want to be able to do that. It's the reason why I do all the education I do is I'm hoping that I can give you that first, like if it's 10 steps to become proficient, I would love to give everybody the first five. If I can give everybody the first five, I would be very happy to give you guys the first five, seven steps so that the last three are much easier for you to get proficient. If I could give you everything up to the point of the practice of the trying things out, running them and trying new things again, if I can give you all of that stuff, it'd be great. Because when I first started, it was literally, here's the manual, which was a pretty good manual, not the worst, um, but pretty good manual. And here it is. It teaches you how to make sure you can use the buttons correctly, but it doesn't really teach you anything else. It's one of the things I'm so always so impressed by when we talk about the Imbrillance manual, you guys know that right now I'm working, uh, or that I now do work for Imbrillance, that... Um, the manual that Brian wrote has a lot of digitizing knowledge in it. And a lot of manuals actually do now. Back in the day, they didn't have the kind of knowledge of compensation and pull and push. There's a little bit, but not the kind of stuff now where you read a manual now and there's almost a, a full education in it. But here's where we kind of change a little bit. And the thing that I think it was interesting for me, um, I what I finally found is I was going through all of the materials uh, that we did have and I found an embroidery magazine. And I was just beside myself because I'm already digitizing at this point, right? The first, at the time I see my first industry magazine, um, I had no idea. Oh, there we go. Well, he says, my my PC days started in punch cards. I respect that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice. But yeah, I, I, so I'm sitting here and having not had any education. I'm not somebody who's gone to any courses. I haven't talked to an industry expert. I at one time tried to talk to a local digitizer. Um, we'll remain nameless because there's no point to talking about that. But the one local digitizer saw the work that I was doing. And this is after I'd already been fairly well in-house. It wasn't too long after I kind of took over doing most of the in-house work. But she actually looked at the work and said, no, you're doing fine. And she was not interested in all of teaching me. She was very upset because I had taken away a revenue stream. I know that now. Uh, it did, back then I was like, this person's a jerk and I'm not happy with you know how they how they kind of acted. But she looked at the work that I was doing and said, you know, you're doing fine. You don't have to, I don't need to teach you anything and I don't want to teach you anything. And that's what, at least that was how it came off. Um, with the lens of memory, I have no idea if it's exactly that. I will say from, from someone who, for whom we were probably a revenue stream and uh, my employer decided to go, hey, I'm going to have some kid do your job and he's doing all right. Hey, I can't, I can't blame that person now. Back then, I was like, man, I'm just trying to do my job. Don't be a jerk. We could be friends, and we all love embroidery, right? I know now that the reality is that money is money, and sometimes people feel badly about that, and I can't feel bad. I can't say that you know I wouldn't feel bad, too. But you know, it is one of those things where uh, at the time, I was like, wow, we should just share everything, and that should be it. And I will say, I still have taken that through my career. There, I've had many opportunities at which I probably could have made more money from what I'm doing by selling a product of what I teach. Uh, yes, I do get paid for teaching some things, especially doing those live classes I've done since all of this started. But there are, for a very long time, the first writing you've ever seen from me, which I'm gonna get to shortly, uh, where I wrote for Stitches Magazine, there was no pay. I never got paid for a word of Stitches Magazine. I did get paid at one point to do a cover art piece, but that was it. There was no pay from Stitches Magazine. So we'll talk about that in a second. Anyway, but yeah, back way back in the day, and this is true from Tom Farr, uh, big dollars for digitizing, absolutely hundreds and hundreds of dollars, especially when people were punching piece by piece. And so going in-house back then, if you had somebody who could do it, was a no-brainer. Uh, it was not a waste of time, and you were not getting overseas files, and you couldn't get things done quickly unless you had somebody you could work with. Um, big money back then. And so honestly, I will say, yeah, totally. I uh, I probably did cause a fairly big dent in her um, in her local business. And I, you know, hey, I feel for that now. 
Uh, I will say that things changed. Uh, it was hard because if you wanted to keep charging the money you did for individual stitch by stitch punching by the time it was much quicker when we had software that would do a lot more of the automation that was worthwhile. Um, that was a hard thing. People wanted to keep making that money when the software had uh, taken away the need for hours of making a fill one stitch at a time. Unless, of course, like me, you're doing crazy blending work and and then you do stuff stitch by stitch just because you want it to look just so. Anyway, uh, and I will say this. Uh, yeah, Candy, I agree with you. Before we go on, uh, love stitch artists because it's easy and friendly. As a techie nerd, I love delving deep in the digitizing manuals. Absolutely, the manuals are great. And that's another thing I tell everybody, read all your manuals. Um, certainly, a lot of that information is button pushing information, not thread needle fabric interaction information. So I think you definitely want to interact with your uh, machine and operating with known good files, but uh, read your manuals and know how to run your stuff. Anyway, so that's the beginning of my kind of work there. And so that's it. I went from a box hauler, I became a machine operator, was a digitizing newbie, and then I had to take right off into being a full-time in-house guy. And along with that, I'll just mention it briefly, um, became an e-commerce manager. I'm actually gonna show, share my screen for a couple things real quick. And uh, first, I did show you guys earlier this three steps to proficient digitizing. Uh, that piece from Mr. Exit, you go back to that link I shared earlier and I can put that up again for you. Um, this piece does kind of show you what I think of as the, the big three steps. And you'll find me talking about similar stuff uh, frequently, but that will give you a little bit more. If you wanna check that out, it'll give you some ideas of what I think it takes to become proficient. But here's something I'm going to show you guys this is actually from later on in my career. Uh, yes, that is a much younger, uh, having much more hair. Also, I am a very bald man, if you don't know. Under the hat, I'm bald. But in the New Mexico sun, even in the winter, I keep covered. <laughs> anyway, this is me uh, at my later shop at Black Duck. A lot of people know me from Black Duck Embroidery and uh, Screen Printing. And it's where I did most of my actual commercial work. And that's me in front of some really big CRT monitors. Yeah, these are gigantic. The, the one in front of me, I was probably the only person to pick that up in the shop. Uh, so, because I'm actually, uh, I'm a fairly large human being. I've not worked out in any great shape, but I am uh, six foot four and, and quite a big guy. So I'm, I'm built like a barn door. So that, that big giant monitor even was a struggle for me to, you can see I did dual monitors even back then. Communications on, digitizing on the right. Uh, but that is me in my uh, K digitizing. They said I like to stay in the dark because I, I came up with a uh, with an art director who liked to work in the dark. So I spent most of my early career in it like that. And yeah, I'm with you, Mike. I do not have monitors either. They were huge and a pain and uh, God's only know all the times hurt my back. And only what, who knows what I had from sitting in front of that thing all the time. It was not great on my ear. We now know that uh, the light balance like this is not probably the best. But being in a cave is not how we should. You can actually the third monitor over on the far left hand side because I was running a separate machine called the e commerce and uh, IT. I also do the IT stuff, uh, I build all of our networks and things. Like that. So, yeah, frequently things up to, up to and including, you know, running Ethernet through the wall, um, building all the websites. I wrote all the websites for our original shops, both this shop and uh, Black Duck when I got there had only an informational site that didn't have anything else. And it was far, far out of date. So, I built all their websites for years. And I ran e-commerce. At this same kind of time, I was starting to do e-commerce. And uh, what I thought I would show you guys if I can, we'll go back just a second if I can find it here. The first thing I'll say is, uh, if you guys don't know, shortly after I really got into my world as a digitizer, 9-11 happened. And a lot of what we did was for FDNY. So it's another one of the times that I, one of the things I think of as a galvanizing moment for me was doing all the work for FDNY. We were actually the officially licensed contractor. We had connections in New York. The owner of the shop uh, was from New York. And we did a lot of the official work for FDNY. And so I'll actually, I'll blow this up full screen for a second. So this is some of the stuff from FDNY. And I actually have this blog post um, if you guys want to see it. And this is the blog post. You can find it at bit.ly slash echeroes, where I kind of talk about my feelings about um, that being the first way that I kind of came into embroidery, doing samples and actually doing the initial work for FDNY. And actually, the other thing I did was all the catalogs and all the e-commerce stuff and we had a site that was called americasheroes.com is not available anymore but we were selling fdny and nypd stuff and we were doing all the official stuff that was giving back to the fire department and the police department and all the stuff out there so i had that was part of my kind of initial trial by fire also as i had to do work for those official people so that was one of the things that was going on as well at the same time um so that i was doing the fdny work and that kind of galvanized my feelings about embroidery as far as why I kind of tend to take it a little too seriously sometimes, uh, it's because in this period of time, it brought the nation together. 
in a way that we had not been before. And uh, people were showing their affiliations. And it really was a, a comfort to people to say, we're standing behind you who have gone through this horrible thing. Um, and for us, it became clear to me that embroidery meant a, a lot more to people than I could have ever imagined. Not only were we making heirlooms, my very first work was um, for a high school graduating class. And it turned out to be the, I think it was not one of the Nautica higher ups kids presence. And I still feel bad about this because his, his, his embroidery class out in like Paramus, New Jersey, or his class got weird embroidery out in Paramus uh, for their, for their, for their, uh, high school graduation, they got some pretty strange embroidery that might have not been my best work. They got some hats that probably didn't look so great, um, but turned out okay. I, if I would have known that my first work was for an important person who was in apparel, I probably would have uh, been slightly less comfortable with it, but hey, you know, it's how these things worked. But I found out at this time that we were making heirlooms. We were helping people show their affiliations, what they believed in, and we were helping people to express themselves. And I started to think of it, as you know, as I was a literature person, as I was someone who was, uh, in education, and that's why I call this office hours, because you know, like a professor, I'm holding my office hours here, telling stories and answering questions as I can. Uh, that people do take these things seriously, that they become heirlooms, that even our commercial work ends up being hauled out of a closet 20 years later when somebody thinks about that job they had or the place they lived or the resort town they visited, and that it was also a way of expressing themselves. And like I said, with my literature background, I thought of it almost like the press. I'm like, this is a way people express themselves, and we should be there to help them express themselves and help them make these creative pieces. And this is something that, you know, it was, like I said, this these really did unite people. They helped people to cope. And they also helped us. Like we said, what we believe when we really did, and I know this is, it's it's a crass way to say, or at least it's, you know, it's cliche, but we wore our hearts on our sleeves really quite literally. We said, here is my emotional center and it's on my sleeve and on my chest and on my hat. And this is what I believe in. This is who I belong to. And this is what I want to be in the world as well as, Hey, you think about a business and people say, okay, well, you're making uniforms, but it's the way that I provide for myself and my family. It's the team that I belong to. And I'm proud of my work. Now, not everybody feels that way about their embroidered hat, but people do. And I always wanted to make sure that we had that available. And that, that really kind of galvanized my feeling about embroidery and made it more serious for me than when I wanted to start teaching and talking about it. I wanted to help people be able to do this. Um, and around, you know, not too far after this time, you know, we, I did, I started kind of working on teaching. I started working on that kind of stuff. And what the first part of it was actually through uh, contests. And I, I actually don't, I had it in the original, um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and pop this back up. We'll talk about the brand stuff here, but if I pop this back up in the very center of the thing here, you'll see this small figure of a woman. Uh, and this piece was for a company called Sundari Imports. And it's a piece that I still show today. I'm really very fond of this piece, right? So here, here it is one more time. Uh, and this piece for Sundari Imports was brought in. It was actually an oil painting. It was a small oil painting that they brought in. Um, it was uh, something that was right out of my league at the time. And they wanted this small but not too small figure from an oil painting done with some text underneath it and recreated for a small left chest on a piquet polo and i did this piece and this was out of my you know out of the stuff i had done i'm like this is pretty artistic i like it i like how i interpreted the arms and the fingers were separated i did some satin stitch carving i did some work with curved fills i had gotten uh my original i had Wilcom at the time that's what we had that was available and we finally got that i actually worked with melco software i started qdt i worked on melco software design shop for a while i worked on Wilcom. i had pulse for a little bit we had a bunch of different softwares from different reasons and in different uh units in the shop however i ended up that we we had Wilcom at the time so i was using so i had curved fills and that was a new thing to me um, so that was cool. I was working with curve fills. I did some textural work. I did, you know, stuff like that. And I liked it. So eventually what ends, ends up happening here is that uh, I find that there's a digitizing competition from Stitches Magazine and I entered it and I won. I won uh, the, uh, the stitch off, I believe was at the time. I became the golden needle later and I might have that backward, even though, no, golden needle was later. Uh, I was actually a judge later on for the golden needles. But at the time I won that category and a couple other awards. And after I won those awards, it kind of came to me from uh, Nicole Rollander, who is the editor of Stitches Magazine, long defunct. Stitches became wearables, um, but Stitches Magazine was great and wearables was great thereafter. But Stitches Magazine uh, came to me asking, hey, would you like to write a blog? And I did. I started a blog called On Links and Needles. 
Some of the posts are still out there and sometimes I will even go back and revisit a post and recreate it and uh, add my new commentary to it because I had some posts out there that I really loved. But the blog on links and needles was the first blog there. And uh, honestly, that's something that, <laughs> that uh, I really enjoyed doing for quite some time there. I wrote, I wrote that blog for Stitches and ASI and they still have some of those things in their back catalog, believe it or not, on the website. But that was done, like I said, that was all done for free. That was, hey, would you like to do it? You were an award winner, we think you can do it. And I did. So I wrote for Stitches Magazine then. And after that, actually, and I'll, I'll go ahead and bring this back off screen. The other thing I ended up doing, and I'll bring, bring that up again, is um, I started writing for the magazine itself. We did this back page. If you guys know Jerry Lee, you know Jerry Lee Medeiros, uh, her, she had an article. It was a back page a long time ago called Ask an Expert. And they eventually repurposed it after Jerry Lee had left. They wanted to launch it again. And myself and Christine Shreve, who's in the comments very frequently, we traded off frequently. Eventually, other people were writing for it. But Christine and I traded off, and we wrote every month the back page of Stitches magazine. Uh, and so I did some stuff for them. I did some photos and articles and stitches and the back page of Stitches Magazine for Ask an Expert. So if you see that we do that Ask an Expert reunion tour, um, that is because uh, she and I were both co-authors of that. And award-winning, honestly. We won some Neil Awards, some publishing awards for business publishing um, for writing that back page in Stitches Magazine. But like I said, four years, what I'd like everybody to know, that's an unpaid position. Uh, it's not something I would say everybody has to do or should do. What I'm going to say, though, is that um, the people who have said to me, how do you get to go to shows? How do you get to write this stuff? Why did they pick you up? And I would say, um, toiling away. I learned how to digitize. I entered some contests, and I entered with stuff right off of my production line. I didn't make special stuff just to win the contest. Um, any, everything I won from, because uh, I won several contests during the years, and we can always talk more about digitizing contests. I've had some art, some pieces about that. An earlier take-up, I think, talked about judging contests. Um, those pieces were all off my production line. So I did that. And when I was called and they said, hey, would you like to write? I did. Uh, I didn't think about it. I did it. And I wanted to share. So I wrote. And so what I always tell people is it's the uh, the 10 year overnight success. Uh, by the time I am teaching classes in shows, by the time I do that, you have to realize that I've not only worked my first job, I've also been 13 years at Black Duck when I leave, when I'm no longer chained to my desk, when I'm not just digitizing all the time, the time that I finally come out, I've been writing articles for many years. So don't get me wrong. Like after, after stitches came Printware magazine and Printware was awesome. Ellen, Emily K over there who now works in a different uh, position altogether. Printware magazine came along and I wrote, I have written for them for many years. I wrote for them for a long time and they became graphics pro magazine that I still write for on occasion, but I had a monthly call in Printware for, for years and years and years. Now Printware, I'm going to be honest with you, that was a paid gig, but that all started it came from years of blogging on my own, sharing things on my own, doing social media, doing webinars for free. All the, the Madeira webinars are not paid webinars either. That's something that I do. You know, I do that stuff uh, with Madeira because I want to teach, not because I'm being paid or given an extra vig for it. I mean, there are, uh, they do send me some Madeira stuff and I've tested stuff for them. I've also tested stuff that's not on the market yet and told them about it. Uh, so we all trade. And, I, and the cool thing about this industry is that there is a lot of working together to develop things and to make the industry better. So I'm not going to tell you don't do anything for free. I, I, I know a lot of people will say no spec, don't do work for free. And I agree. I don't like entering a bunch of like design contests where a big corporation gets a free logo out of a bunch of starting artists. What I will say is entering contests, sharing your work, showing your work, writing, becoming a subject matter expert are things you do to develop yourself frequently. And they're not always going to come with the dollar sign. And you can't always look at them as just sales tools. You have to do it because you believe and you want to do it. And then the truth of the matter is the sales the position, everything comes from documenting what you're actually doing. Uh, getting out there and doing the thing, learning the thing, helping people, documenting it. And that documentation and the sharing will bring people who want to be part of that or who would, or who need what you're already doing. So do you sometimes have to float things or make your own projects to get it started? Absolutely. Do I do some of my own projects and passion projects to develop new techniques? Absolutely. So it's not that you never do any of that stuff, but what I will say is that the, the bulk of it is sharing. So that first period of time where I was blogging for on links and needles um, and for the entirety of writing for stitches was just something that I did to share. But what I will say is it brought lots and lots of opportunities down the road. And uh, like I said, 10 year overnight success. And uh, I worked at Black Duck after SGI and Matrix went away. They were purchased by Black Duck. And, and I'll tell you this too. They thought they, they didn't have any place for me. At Black Duck, they were originally thinking they were going to have to fire me. Uh, and they brought me in and I started showing my digitizing. They had a digitizer on who was doing fine. So I'm not no, no maligning that digitizer there. But I came on with a little bit of history and a little bit of ability. And I worked on their websites. 
I got them working on e-commerce, which they had not touched. And I, the digitizing I did for them was quality. I mean, I, I can say it was high quality. It was good digitizing. There are a lot of digitizers probably in this stream and people who have taught who have surpassed me or do things that I think are more artistic or better than me. But at the same time, I will say I did good, solid quality digitizing and I did work for great production work, you know, work that was efficient because I, having been an operator, I, I really knew how to make efficient work. And that work was solid and I think had a little bit of artistic flair that people started to come to me for. Uh, because I was willing to do something that was answering a question that was uh, working toward a design ethos that was improving or altering the art, making an interpretation that was better as embroidery than it was in print. And it's something that I prided myself on, but it's a lot of work. And I'll just say that I'm not just a natural artist who this stuff comes from nowhere. I was constantly in the libraries looking at textile books. I was in everybody from my mother on can tell you I spent time getting out hand embroidery books and looking at how stitches got, went together, looking at textiles, looking at other people's embroidery. And my wife will also tell you uh, embarrassingly that I cannot go to any clothing store. I'm sure that I look like a huge creep in <laughs> every clothing store I've ever been in. Because uh, before what we're going through now, I would go and grab every piece of embroidery, take pictures of it. As soon as cameras had phones in them, um, or phones had cameras in them, that was hilarious. As soon as we had the camera phone, I was constantly snapping pictures of embroidery and writing down things that I thought about techniques and trying stuff out. So I have always been someone who's studying and taking in. So that's why I say, I say consume broadly and then create with focus. So consume broadly, learn about all these different techniques, different ways of making marks, different art styles, stuff like that. Consume broadly and then plan something out and execute it and test it and actually make it work consume broadly and create with focus and that will help you get there. But that's something I did, right? So that's what, that's kind of how that went. And I, I, they ended up keeping, not only keeping me on, but I became the digitizer, the full-time digitizer. And the other guy who was digitizing went to be doing production. And eventually he actually decided to leave. And uh, we had someone else doing embroidery management and production. And then I actually was no longer in production. I would sometimes do production samples myself. And toward the end, I was digitizing so much that I actually didn't sample for myself unless I really had to. I got to a point where, especially when I was doing, you know, tens of things a day, I could digitize, send it out, and almost never needed it back unless there was a problem. So if, as long as I got all the information I needed, most of the time you could send it back to me. If there was something small, they would describe it to me, circle it, show me the sample. I could usually fix that then, or most of the time, really simple logos, corporate stuff, I didn't need a second shot at it. But this is when I was swimming in that water. I would say today, I'm probably not quite as fast or as good as I was then at doing things immediately. I probably have to do more edits now than I did then. And that's how it is. When you're swimming in the waters and doing the commercial work all day long, you are, I'd say, better than someone who's, truthfully, than someone who's educating, or at least you're quicker, someone who's educating and developing tools and doing other stuff that's out beyond that. Um, but I will say that's where I was. And I did that for 13 years of Black Duck concurrently, writing the blog at the same time, writing for printware at the same time on my own time, so this is something, this is weekend time, this is nighttime, this is late hours, and creating pieces for that to some degree, because we did eventually start doing pieces for contests that were separate from the uh, commercial stuff, because we actually did a, a very like, um, kind of like Survivor, Top Chef or something. We did some contests like that with the company where we did some multimedia with the printers and me, and it was stuff that had specific challenges, very different than the stuff I did earlier where I had won my award straight off the production line. Uh, and I did a lot of development at that time too, where I would do development and uh, honestly development of things like um, I would help with uniform programs with local hospital groups or stuff like that, where I was developing not only the embroidery, but e-commerce programs and packages, stuff like that, because I was managing both um, a very large e-commerce site for one of the top realtors in the country, as well as um, there is a hospital chain that I did all that e-commerce for. And like I said, and our general e-commerce for the shop. So all of that was going on at the same time. And eventually I got to this point where I had a chance to, uh, I know we're getting in bonus time. We'll, we'll finish this up soon. I had a chance to go to some shows. I went with the owners of, my, of the company at the time, with Black Duck, and they actually took me to one show. And I actually had a chance to work with an e-commerce company called uh, Deco Network, which you may know. Uh, and you, you see pictures of me in blue, and that was something that was on that piece too. I had this blue getup that was the color of the company. Uh, I worked for them for a while. I worked on developing some embroidery stuff in the back end, but also worked on helping with e-commerce stuff and that. But after that, I mean, I did that for a couple years. And it was good times. So I enjoyed that work. Uh, spent a lot of good time in, in Atlanta and at the shows, and it was cool. And at the time, I was teaching. I, at that same time, I left Black Duck. Uh, it was hard. I wanted to stay at Black Duck and do everything. I wanted to keep on doing production all day and still teach and go out and do that stuff. But it turned out that I could not do all of it. I couldn't run the e-commerce sites and digitize all day 
and then do all the articles and teach and get to go to the shows and everything else. But Deco Network allowed me to then help them with their side of things, uh, supporting, managing partnerships with different companies, talking to different companies, helping them with, uh, you know, supply chain stuff and talking to the distributors and managers and being a bridge to decorators who knew what was going on uh, on the floor, on the shop floor, someone who had been there. And I worked with them and they had me go to shows and help me to get to all these shows. But in between there, one of the great things I got to do before that, and I wanted to bring this up briefly, was I got to do a thing called the shop tune up. And I'll actually show you this on screen if I can. First, here's, here's me again, but let's go past this. And, and this is something else I can talk about later. This is Regina, who's awesome. Say her last name in case she doesn't like want to volunteer that. But I got to go see Regina. And we were out at her shop. She has a home base shop. And the very first time I got to leave, and you see I'm wearing a black duck shirt in that piece. I've got a tone on tone black duck shirt uh, in, that, in that piece. I was still at Black Duck. And I got to stay with her for a week and we talked about shop stuff. I had been teaching people for a long time already online. I had been writing articles. I had been consulting with people personally, uh, generally over the phone or online. And I got to finally go out and see her. She was out uh, near DC. And we got to talk about her shop and the stuff she was doing there and how she was managing. And it was like my first big consulting you know, visit. It was the first time I got to go out and do that stuff. I did that for printware and we did a little series of articles about it and stuff like that. It was really cool. Um, and Regina was one of the people who said to me, Eric, you need to go for it. You need to get out and uh, do this thing where you get to go. And this is when I finally learned that there was opportunities at Deco Network. So I actually went from there to Deco uh, and part of the entire thing, I have to thank Regina because she said, you know, you need to teach. This is in your blood. You need to do it. You need to teach more. I know you're already going out there, but you need to be at the shows. You need to teach. You need to travel. And so I, I did. I left Black Duck and honestly, it was hard. I still love embroidery production. I still love doing apparel production to the point that sometimes you'll catch me on a single head machine making pieces just because I, I can't help myself. I'm developing things with uh, now with Brilliance, and we'll talk a bit about that real quick. Um, but you know that part of that's because I still love embroidery and production and commercial embroidery too. It's not just that I love embroidery. I love doing art embroidery. I do. Um, but I love commercial production and I still love helping people do that kind of work as well. And Regina, I have to thank her a great deal because it was a, a great time. And also, by the way, niche marketing. The one other thing I didn't tell you about, if you go to read this, and I actually have this article. I'll pop this up on the banner real quick, folks. Uh, we got bit.ly slash folk niche. It's me talking about the folk instrument market. When that first company, I before Black Duck started to die, I actually paid my paycheck out of running an e-commerce site where I was doing niche marketing to the folk music groups. Like I said, I showed you guys the dulcimers. There's a big wall of those. Um, that's where I kind of learned a lot about niche marketing is having to pretty much save my job <laughs> by doing that. And anyway, I, I thought I would show you also, here's Black Duck. Uh, there's still, this is a new website, not the one I built, but it's lovely. That design that's running on screen right now and that one that's right there. Um, despite the fact that I haven't been there in some years, those are actually still my designs. So what I'm, what I'm happy about, they had me do that one design for Chambers. And I know that in their back catalog, though they have a lot of designs done, and I know Vitor does some of their work and there's a, other people doing work for them now. Um, that they still have some of my classic designs that are running for uh, companies that have been there for a long time. But Black Duck is a lovely company and uh, Doug and Dana Bird over there are great people. But like I said, eventually I just had to spread my wings a little bit. Ha ha, no pun intended. And I left Black Duck to go out uh, and tour and be with uh, Deco. But then, and like I said, and so that was lovely. And I have to say thank you to Regina for, for helping me along as I was helping her with things in her company and helping her with um, her digitizing her embroidery, her e-commerce and the, what she wanted to do. And we were discussing all this lovely stuff. I also got to learn a little bit about what I wanted and I wanted to teach and I wanted to help. And what also comes out of that is that um, not too long after that, still at, at Deco Network, I was talking with uh, Brian Bailey, creative of Brilliance. And the thing is, I actually wrote an article about knockdown stitches. What you guys might not know is knockdown. The actual term knockdown stitches is a trademark and is specific to the automated knockdown stitch process that is in, uh, in Brilliance Enthusiast. That's the software package that it's in. There's an automated one-click way to add a knockdown stitch that uh, Brian created. And he actually has the real trademark. If you see somebody using the term knockdown stitches, uh, Brian actually started that and has the trademark. Uh, so knockdown stitches have become kind of like Kleenex, and that's the thing you have to work against. So he actually contacted me and said, hey, I know you got this blog, but... Two things. Number one, knockdown stitch is a trademark term. It's something that actually I have a trademark on and I can show you all the stuff for it. But hey, we're both in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Why don't we know each other? I know you love embroidery. I love embroidery. Why don't we hang out? And so Brian and I started hanging out and we did. We hung out and talked about embroidery and we talked about uh, the technical nature behind it. And I'll say uh, his knowledge of 
computational geometry is certainly going to beat mine. I am someone who uses a hammer. He is someone who designs better hammers. Uh, so Brian knows an incredible amount and, and he actually wanted to bring me on to do the work I do now, which is to kind of help with um, a little bit of everything, but you know, there's some development work in there, some interaction with the commercial market in there. There's uh, certainly some work with customers in e-commerce. Like I said, as you guys know, I'm itching to get back to my display of e-commerce channels right now because I've got some stuff I'm working on for this very important weekend. But Brian said, hey, come along with me. We are a group of embroidery geeks and nerds. And I think that this is a home for you where you can develop some really cool new stuff and you know learn more about how this thing is made. And so I went to Imbrilliance. And that's really how it came to be, where um, also there were some other reasons why I was thinking for a while there, there were some, some questions about travel and how much travel I was going to do for my previous job, which I now do much less than I originally was slated to do. Uh, when I left there, traveling was what I wanted to do, but it would have been pretty much on the road constantly. And I finally got to a point where when we were gonna do that, I didn't wanna do that. Um, though I do love traveling, and I love seeing everybody. And I love being at the shows, especially Dax gave me a great chance. That's the other thing too. I taught at Long Beach, but then uh, at ISS, so the Impressions Show, now the Impressions Expo. Um, but Dax, Decorated Apparel Expo, Scott Ritter, Margie Ritter, the Ritters, they gave me a chance to do these long workshops, these four hour workshops where I got to dig in. And some people who are here listening know me from those four hour workshops. That's where I got to be me, where unlike the way other people teach, don't get me wrong, what you get when you get one of my classes is very much like the college lecture courses that I came out of. It does mean that when you come out of it, you've probably gotten more information than you planned on. Uh, you get a nice big handout that's laid out with all the stuff because you get materials, you get your text, you get a nice lecture, uh, you get some examples, and I like to talk to you after the fact if you want to. And the thing is, uh, they let me be that person, which I have to thank uh, Scott and Margie very much for that. And also the people at Impressions also. I ended up teaching there and I have been teaching at all the Impressions Expo shows since I started. Um, but I will, I have to really give them credit for, they, they handed the floor to me uh, from, the, from the webinars I had done, from the other work I had done, from the writing I had done. They trusted me with four hours with uh, you wonderful people. And I have to thank them for that. Same thing as, like I said, I always thank all the people down the road. Nicole Rollander for trusting me with Stitches Magazine. Uh, Emily K. Thompson, and after that, uh, Carly, Michelle Holman, uh, over at um, Printware. Carly and Mary Kay, awesome. And Carly and I worked together for a very long time before Printware uh, changed and they became uh, Graphics Pro. And Cassandra Green there now is going to bring me back on for some more stuff, and that's awesome. But every, there's a bunch of people who trusted me down the road to do what I do, and I cannot thank them enough. So once again, with this story, because it's Thanksgiving, I have to say I'm very thankful for all the people who trusted me. I like to think I did good work and I shared enough and helped enough that I justified it. And I like to believe that I give you guys enough good value that I justify my place. But I will say that a lot of people really let me be me uh, across the point of this from, from them and onto Brian Bailey. Now, Brian lets me be me in a way that a lot of people might not have done before. So I have to thank them as well. And I appreciate not only them, but I appreciate all of you who have trusted me to come and have this content and learn from me as well. But we did these great big four-hour classes at DAX, and that was awesome. And I got to do that during the time I was at DECO, and also uh, Mia Tech over at DECO Network, and um, the Owners of DECO Network, and everybody there, and Brandon who brought me on. Um, everybody who's trusted me down the road to do the things they had me, me do, I appreciate. Even if we all didn't end up at the same places at the same times, or if we moved on to do different things, I appreciate everybody who gave me uh, a chance to do what I want to do. And what I've wanted to do all this time is to teach. So how did, I, how did I get here, right? In the natural fashion, <laughs> sliding in sideways as decorators do. Uh, started out operating, started out working, uh, did the thing, worked hard, studied, analyzed, ran designs, saw where it wasn't working, changed things, ran them again. Uh, learned from everybody. Also, all the people in the magazines, by the time I found the magazines and when I finally did get them, now I was already digitizing for some time when that happened. Like I always think like uh, Bonnie, Oh God, Bonnie's articles and Jerry Lee, we talked. And I did go to one embroidery class one time. I went to a class with Jerry Lee uh, a long time ago. But by the time I did that, I was already doing all the analysis the class was teaching. Cool class. I got to meet really cool people. And that's what I think the best thing that was. But I've only gotten to be there at one point. But we had some really cool stuff that happened after that. And like I said, every everywhere down the road, what really was this. I said yes, even though I wasn't quite sure. I put in a lot of work and I did a lot of analysis and thoughtful work. That's a big deal. Um, and I'll say it's a lot of risk and I wasn't always right. 
I did a lot of things wrong. Over the course of the years, I've ruined a lot of garments. I've been wrong about a lot of things. I've made a lot of assumptions that weren't right. And they look a lot nicer now than they did then. Because I make assumptions now with an entire body of work behind me. And it's why I teach this is because I'm hoping that the body of work I did will be the stepping stone for the people in front of me. And when I see somebody who's doing better work than I have done or, or that I believe I currently do, and if they say, oh, yeah, I read that article. It really helped me with this piece. I go to bed easy that night which is something I don't do well. I'm not a good sleeper, as many of you know, from me being up all hours. But I really do uh, I, I really do feel like that's what we're here to do. And so, like I said, got out there, started working, went left Black Duck, started teaching in all the classes, and that's how I got to where I am now. Um, why am I doing all of this? Um, and also, I'm going to say, here's the other thing that's true. If you're willing to put in the work that other people won't do, um, permission isn't the only thing that you need. If you're willing to put that work in. I'm not saying hustle till you die. And I'll say that I'm, I'm someone who needs to rest a little more often than I do. And I think you shouldn't. Hustle isn't a religion. Yes, I think there's work to be put in, but it was also work that followed my curiosity and things that I wanted to do. Find the part of it that you want and chase it down. Because if you be you, if you do the thing that is uniquely you and you do it very well and you put yourself into it, it'll show and it will bring you to opportunity. It's amazing how that happens. And honestly, people will trust you because you believe in it. If you're faking it, it's a lot harder. And the things that I've faked over my life, sometimes you can make it happen, but it's not the way it is when you really believe in it and you speak from your passion and your curiosity. So follow that curiosity down. And sometimes do you have to meld it with the day job when you need money? Absolutely. Uh, but here's the thing. If you think that every time I did, you know, Joe's plumbing logo that I was super excited to do another guy chasing a truck with a wrench, not every time. <laughs> but I was excited about making a technically good piece of embroidery. So I would stop and say, I'm going to go ahead and run this down and see, can I make the coolest looking pipe wrench I've ever made today? And I did that. And I said, what about texture on the pipe wrench? Can I make it something different? Can I do something cool? Can I talk to this guy about doing 3D foam at a time that it wasn't being done? Can I talk to this guy about doing a reverse applique? Can I make something creative happen even when I'm working with a fairly mundane piece of art? Absolutely. So you still chase down your curiosity and people give you a lot of permission when you reliably chase things down. So that's something that I will say. Say a lot of yes when you can. Don't kill yourself. And hey, don't give away the farm. Don't do things that are valuable for nothing. But realize sometimes that when you're trading, you can trade value for something that isn't money and still be getting off a good trade. I think that's true. Uh, so don't let somebody abuse you, certainly. But when you're doing work to get out and be in the stream of things with people, it's okay to do some stuff for free. And a lot of designers are definitely going to tell you no spec. I'm kind of like that too. Like I said, not, I'm not talking about going and doing contests for big companies who are using artists. Like I said, I am saying that there are sometimes things where you chase down your own passion, you show it to people, you do work for people you believe in. And that's how you actually make yourself what you want to be. You put yourself out there, you become an expert by doing the thing and documenting it and sharing it. And it's okay to share when you're not at your best. I have pieces that I look at even in the magazines when I was already doing this fairly proficiently that I would definitely do different now. Um, and I open my old files and I find things that, I, that are horrible shortcuts. You're going to grow. You're going to become what you were meant to be as you follow that curiosity down and as you do the work. But is it work? Absolutely it's work. Is it always fun? No, not every time it's not fun. <laughs> Sometimes you're just chasing something, you're beating your head against it. I will say there is a great relief in solving a problem that you've been working on for a long time. So with that, guys, I think that's really all I wanted to cover. I'm going to tell a couple other bonus stories because this is a fun day and we're just hanging out. Uh, we'll come more embroidery stories and maybe, maybe, maybe I'll play a little tiny bit of music if I can make myself do it. Um, but I will literally just noodle around finger picking. I'm not going to play a song. Uh, maybe that's how we'll do for the outro. <laughs> Since we don't have an extra meme, but here's a couple of little stories I thought I would bring up that are fun. Um, as you guys know, I, I sometimes tell stories about stuff, but here's a fun one. I showed you this piece, this piece here, Karen Kuhn photography. Um, the reason I bring that up, this shot, why this shot looks so dramatic, this picture of me, it looks so dramatic and kind of artistic. Um, Karen Kuhn is this awesome photographer who was at the time who was living out here. I don't know where she's living now. And she did a lot of photographs of uh, famous celebrities. So it's amazing to me that I have a picture of myself from this era uh, from Karen Kuhn. Because Karen Kuhn was taking pictures of big celebrities and, and uh, musicians and stuff at the time. So this is a photographer I should not have had any access to. But why we did have access to Karen is because she came in looking to get some work done. And this is one of those fun things, right? People go and have a special work done, right? 
Karen came in and brought in, once again, an oil painting. Funny enough, I've done a few oil painting works where I'm, I'm actually working from a painting. She had this very tattoo styled art that came in on an oil painted original. And I mean, we had the original in house, which was her logo, but it wasn't really a logo. It was, some, it was a, a painting. And this is the piece, right? This is the piece that I made from it. What you're looking at here is on a piece of cotton duck that's very much like a Carhartt fabric. But what this is, she released a collection of her photographs and this is the binding on her book. So the book of her photographs that she had at the time, the collection of her photographs, all of the bindings, we ran those and I digitized this cover and this embroidered tattoo style cover from that original art piece. And you can see it's New Mexico and we've got a nice Zia right in the middle. Once you see that Zia symbol, you know New Mexico is not far behind generally. Um, anyway, we, we did this piece from that painting and this was on all the covers of her books. And she was very excited about that. She loved it and offered to come in and take pictures of us and train one of her pho uh, photography students in house. So that's where we get this picture is that Karen Kuhn, if you look her up, uh, she came in and took pictures of all of us working and she did it, wanted to do it under the lighting conditions from the place themselves. And that was part of it. So this is the actual lighting conditions from the place. And she was using some reflectors and stuff, but not additional lighting. She actually used a lamp that I had to make this dramatic lighting happen. So I've got a picture, I've got a rock star picture of me digitizing, which I really shouldn't have. Uh, the other fun part of the story is Karen Kuhn is an incredibly energetic human being. Uh, I like her very much, but she scared the living heck out of me because <laughs> I'm actually a fairly unassuming guy and I've had some people, uh, everybody likes to make fun of me because someone will run up to me at a trade show and give me a big old hug and I'm not ready for it because I, I tend to not uh, creep up on people or touch people very much. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big human being. I don't like to scare anybody. So I don't, I don't run up on people very much. But uh, Karen came into the shop and she had asked me, she had this big piece and this piece is pretty large. I mean, this thing is like five inches wide. It's fairly large. It's on a big book. And she said, can I put this on a hat? And I'm like, well, you're not going to get the exact amount of hat, but let me see what I can do. I'll work it down and I'll recreate it for the hat and we'll see what of the essence I can get out of it. Since she liked the original rendition that we did that was very kind of old school tattoo art. And this is what we did. We managed to get it down to a small size. We actually had it on some uh, camouflage hats. I don't have that camouflage hat here to show you um, right now. But this picture is, uh, you know, I, I think this one actually has a little bit more zoom we can give you. Not a great picture, but I've got this in several pieces because it's got some awesome little work with the uh, text that was done, all hand lettered, painted work. And she got the hat and I am not lying to you, and this is uh, not disparaging her whatsoever. She leapt up on the counter, she, like leapt across. We had a counter between us. She leapt up on the counter and kissed me on the cheek. And I uh, I turned eight shades of red and everybody made fun of me forever because she was so jazzed with this thing when she saw it. Because I told her, I'm like, let me see what I can do. I don't know how great it's going to look when I get it down to that size because we had it on, on low profile stuff all the way through. Uh, the stuff that you're seeing here, like a mid-profile hat like this. And this is actually a little too high. This sample, I think, is, is set a little too high for my production people. But she was so excited about it. She jumped across the counter and gave me a big hug and kissed me on the cheek. And I had no idea it was coming. And she literally jumped herself, like, like did a seal landing right up on top of that counter and kissed me on the cheek. And that is one of a million stories I have about in the shop that, uh, um, suffice it to say, I turned red as a beet and then white as a sheet in, in cycles. So everybody was... Uh, thought it was very hilarious. And apparently, like I said, people really do uh, resonate with the stuff we make people. So, uh, and by the way, if you're out there, Kara, I'd much love you. You had some really awesome pictures and doing that stuff was so fun. I, I really, I was so honored that I got to do the piece that was on the cover of your book. So thank you very much, Kara. That was something I always loved. And I'm glad I got to share you some of that stuff, guys. So I, all the time at Black Duck was wonderful. And so I no no problems there. I love where I am now at Embroyance. I'm, I'm getting to help people in a way I haven't gotten to before uh, and getting to work on the development of software and watching it be, not only it was already a great piece of software, but going from what that is into something better, uh, better, bigger, faster. And with all the cool, incredible stuff that Brian thinks of that nobody has thought of, it has been really enjoyable. And I love being able to help all the people there. And honestly, my time at Deco Network was great too. And I got to really connect a lot of people. So Throughout my career, I had a wonderful career. I'd say that if I got to say one thing that made it what it is, uh, it is uh, the interaction with people out there and putting yourself out there, saying yes. If there's a second thing to that, the second part of it is uh, I like to think of myself as a booster. And I don't mean that I'm just, you know, to say it in a colloquial way, I'm not just blowing sunshine up everybody's backside here. I'm not just trying to be nice to be nice. I really do believe everybody needs to be supported and celebrated. Not everybody gets it. And I think that we should all be out there supporting each other and celebrating each other and helping each other get to where we want to get. And when I like a post of yours that has some embroidery on it, that's cool. 
I think it's cool and I like it. And I want you to know that. And I want, because I remember the time when I was, uh, the way they called this colloquially, you know, the slang was, uh, we were mushrooms. We were kept in the dark and fed manure. I, I worked in a little dark corner and that's all I knew. Um, there was a lot of time where I could have used a boost where someone said, hey, you know, good going, you're getting on your way. And here's a couple of things you can do with that stitch angle to make that letter look all right. Uh, there are a lot of times I would have really benefited from someone saying that. And I want to be that person for someone. So if I, if I have become your embroidery friend, embroidery uncle, embroidery dad, whatever, I've heard a lot of things uh, that people have decided I am. Uh, I'm happy to be that. And I'm glad to be your embroidery friend. But with that, guys, you know what? All right. I said I would mess around with the dulcimer. This dulcimer is here. I will make noise on this. I don't know how good it's going to turn out. I'm in a horrible chair with arms that I would never play in if I was playing uh, up on the folk music stages again <laughs> over at the uh, folk festival. I would not be doing that at all. But uh, this thing is tuned DAD. It is a hourglass dulcimer. You can see that it is a McSpadden. Since we like to get technical here, it's a McSpadden dulcimer. Uh, and I will make some sounds as I play you guys off. So uh, with that, guys, I'm really glad you came and had this time with me. I know it was kind of a strange time and maybe not as educational as some of the stuff I usually do. But uh, I am very thankful for you. You folks who are reciprocators, and Mike, thank you again for coming up with that. You reciprocators, you folks who are here who are listening, learning, and trying, you are the tops. You are the creme de la creme. You have already risen to the top because you are learning, because you care, and because you want to get better. And honestly, I am happy to share this space with you and to make space for you as you get going. So I am incredibly happy for you guys to have been here with me today, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. If those of you who are like me who are be working this weekend, well, you know what? You're not working alone. And uh, thank you very much. And I cannot wait until next week. With that, I'm going to put up the banner since all I'll be doing is staring down. I'll, well, maybe not. I'll, I'll play a little bit and then we'll see. But I'll play my little bit of the dulcimer, just a tiny bit of plucking around. And uh, you know what? After that, I'm going to go ahead and cut it off and wish you guys a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much for being here. All right. Let's see what we can do. Thank you all for being here.